once again, thank you for uh, your continued support. It's probably back in uh, 1989, 1991 when they first started doing this. They figured it was going to be a two or three year thing, maybe four or five. And we survived past the demise of Resource Central. We survived past the demise of a lot of things. We're still here. We're here for the 25th time. Without each and every one of you, everybody in the past, people who even just expressed support online, none of this would be possible. Who would have ever thought? Every year's got a theme. This year, it kind of led up to, I guess anniversaries kind of helped play things playing things here, kind of led up to, you know what, we haven't really talked about the disk the, the, uh, disc drive much in all of these years. Of course, without the disk drive, a lot of the creativity behind the platform wouldn't even have existed. And all the talented programmers and whatnot that came out of the woodwork, but, you know, all these companies that said, we're going to protect this stuff, and we're going to do all this cool stuff with the disk drive, and, you know, they take two, three, four months working on it. <coughs> Guys in labs, probably not. <coughs> smart guy is somewhere else, and then the average 10 year old comes along and does it in five minutes. <laughs> five minutes might even be too much, but <clears throat> there was fun stories back then. Uh, having developers come find me and say, well, How did my software get up in one little file on an AE line? What's an AE line anyway? That's for another session. But without all that, and uh, <coughs> we always say each year, How are we going to top this? And then we quickly remember, it's not one to top, every year is different. However, we'll say this much, that this year, we do have a pretty darn good action pack schedule. Almost had a double track a little bit, but didn't really want to do that. So things are kind of spread out to where the stuff that the nighttime crowd would be more interested in is going to last later in the night. Typical stuff throughout the day. We're going to have a chance to see everything. There are a few things with programming going on concurrently, but that will even probably be concurrently to the fact that it will be in this room, one end to the other, or using the base of the other room over here. So pretty much all of our activities will be done here. And uh, with that, uh, our keynote speaker this year is Randy Wigginson. track sector, <laughs> which was the heart of all the fun that everybody had to do with all the things that you can imagine with this too. And uh, you have a special a special guest that if uh, the Twitterverse wasn't <laughs> alive last night, uh, between the two of these folks here, Steve Wozniak is sitting down here in the front. Now, here. He's going to be here uh, tomorrow and part of Friday. So, participating in all the sessions and whatnot. Another little uh, note of uh, interest is the last time Steve Wozniak was at Kansas Fest it was at 2000. It was in 2003. We were at a different college. And something happened yesterday that kind of, 2003 was real interesting for us. It was probably one of the first years and one of the only ones ever since that we were able to sit outside and eat. <laughs> the weather was just amazing for this this year, in this part of the year in this area. And last night, we were able to sit outside and eat again. Did you bring a winter cloud from Australia on the back of that airplane? <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, anyway. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is uh, actually quite an honor. I was really surprised to be invited when uh, Stephen first approached me. He said, there's an Apple II festival. Really? <laughs> um, I don't even think I responded to your first email because I thought it wasn't real. <laughs> um, 
But anyways, I'm glad to be here. You know, someone should have told me about Jack Stack. That's a pretty awesome barbecue. I would have come earlier. Uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, talk I actually gave to a set of interns at uh, Square because um, the youngins have no sense of history, so <laughs> I had to teach them what it was all about. So occasionally you'll, some things you might say, well, I already know this, but well, I'm repeating it because I'm old and I need to repeat myself. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring a little more um, light and detail to the history of Apple. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, in the beginning, Watts created the Apple computer, you know, <laughs> saw that it was good. <laughs> Steve Jobs saw that he could sell a lot. And, you know, so, um, but actually, there was a lot more to it. Um, so I'm going to start off with a very brief bit of personal history. I um, grew up in Santa Clara Valley, um, now known as Silicon Valley. When I grew up, this is what it looked like. We were more known, more known for fruit orchards than the fruit computer that now comes from there. Um, I started programming uh, after eighth grade, and eighth, nobody had personal computers back in those days. Remember <coughs> that? For those of you who can't, um, you had to go somewhere and operate a computer because they were big and bulky and everything. So um, here's my first computer. <laughs> uh, actually, a, a lot of the interns didn't think I was joking. Uh, so, uh, this is actually the ENIAC. Uh, no, I, I started in 1974. Um, this is what it really looked like. And uh, I mean, it was basically the size of a refrigerator. I um, got a chance to, uh, got introduced to it over summer school at Homestead High School. Uh, after eighth grade, and um, basically it was sort of like I was nerd at first sight. I just, <laughs> I just fell in love with it. I, I couldn't imagine not having a computer. Um, but the problem is, is that then after summer school ended, I didn't have a computer. I didn't have access to a computer, and so that was that was a pretty horrible state of affairs. Um, I really wanted to have my own computer. I was going through withdrawals and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, I found out about this group called the uh, Homebrew Computer Club, and their whole goal in life was to help people build their own computers. So this is actually what the Homebrew Computer Club looked like, uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, and um, we would meet there every uh, couple of weeks. You know, there's a typical meeting. There was a lot of people in there. Um, the problem is that I was like 14. And so I really couldn't drive. So I had to get someone to give me a drive, uh, a ride. And it wasn't exactly real close to home, so I had to find a friend or parent or someone like that. It was a real hassle. So I stood up one day and I said, um, if anybody lives near Homestead High School, I could really use a ride to um, the Homebrew Computer Club. You know, I'll, I'll walk over to your place or whatever. I uh, just really want to be here. I love learning. I love all you guys, etc. So, at the break, um, this guy came up, introduced himself, uh, really nice. Said, "Yeah, I live in Villa Sara, apartment 36B. Um, yeah, we can carpool. Just you know, come on down and we'll ride up together." I said, "Great. What was your name again?" Uh, Steve Wozniak. Nice to meet you. So, <laughs> that was that was how it came to be. Um, this was. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a Fiat. Uh, this was Waz's car back then. No, no, it wasn't that one. But this, was, this is the best picture I can come up with. Okay, so I actually didn't take a picture of it. Um, we always wondered if we would make it. Uh, it was such a horrible car. <laughs> really, Waz and I could tell stories about that for probably an hour. Uh, in fact, one day I end up seeing it on the side of the freeway. Um, it, it broke down on him on his way to Apple, and uh, he, he abandoned it and never looked back. <laughs> Have you driven many Fiat since? <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, our, so a typical evening going to the Homebrew Computer Club is, is that um, we would pack everything up into his car. He was, uh, was just, uh, designing the Apple One at this time. Um, had to pack in the uh, board, power supply, the TV, which was pretty heavy, and a cassette, or no, actually we didn't have a cassette. Um, and we drive up, unpack it, 
set it up, and then for like the next hour, Claus would sit in the front um, vestibule typing hex like this. I mean, he was the fastest touch typist I've ever seen. Um, and he was typing in his basic interpreter so that by the time the break came, he could show people this cool Apple One computer that had basic. Um, and it was pretty awesome. I mean, people were really, really impressed. Um, and then afterwards, we would break everything down, put it into the car, and no evening was complete without a stop at Denny's. Um, you have something about greasy fast food. Uh, so, um, but we would stop here, and I would lay Yes. Um, I don't know how he put up with me, but I would spend like about the next two hours just asking questions constantly. Um, I'm sure I was pretty annoying, but I mean, I was just soaking up all this knowledge. For um, years, actually, people would say, you know, where did you graduate from? And I would say, again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I still stick with that. So um, anyways, uh, like I said, I gave this talk to the intern. So let's do a little quick intro on who is Waz. Well, Waz, besides being a really nice guy, uh, and a fashionable dresser. Uh, is also an incredible jokester. Uh, when you know, I met him, uh, he was operating the dial a joke service. Um, he had, and you know, I'm not endorsing this, I'm just giving this for historical uh, context, <laughs> jokes like, you know, why did the Italians move out of the outhouse? Um, the poles downstairs are making too much noise. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, as I recall, uh, Waz was threatened with a lawsuit by the president of the um, Polish American Congress. <laughs> and um, basically he said, well, look, my name is Wozniak. You think it's not Polish, you know? I mean, so. I said, how about if I change it to Italian jokes? And he said, well. Oh. <laughs> so Italian jokes are fine, not Polish jokes. Um, yeah, he's, he's really into jokes. He uh, even produced a, uh, co-produced a joke book. Um, Steve, I love you, but this is not your best work. <laughs> um, there are such immortal favorites in there as how do you congratulate a computer? Data boy. My uncle, a Jesuit priest, has five great joke books. Only number four is bad all the other four. He was also a practical joker, so um, I got this bit of history from Bill Fernandez when he was living at uh, Berkeley. He had a dorm room that overlooked a, um, a public telephone, and he would call down to that phone. And if someone eventually answered, he'd say, Hello, this is Ramar the Mystic. In your future, I see water. And at the same time, we throw a water balloon out. <laughs> <laughs> Rumor has it you had a lot more fun with it than they did. <laughs> um, so anyways, that's that's brief intro to Waz. Uh, brief intro to Jobs. Jobs was a, um, a total hippie, a product of the 60s. Um, he, you know, famously dropped acid. Uh, he was disappointed always that Bill Gates never dropped acid. He thought he would have been a better person if he had. Um, seriously, that's documented. Um, he was a fruitarian. He basically lived literally on fruits and nuts. Um, Ashton Kutcher, during the filming of the job movie, tried to live on that diet. Couldn't actually. Um, got very, very ill. So um, he was also an unbelievably terrible driver. He was really scary. Um, he was not patient. I mean, he loved just weaving through traffic. He was really something else. Um, he was extremely charismatic. Uh, some people call it the reality distortion field. Um, the way we put it is that he had the charisma of like a Gandhi or a Hitler, and where he fell on the moral spectrum, kind of hard to figure out. <laughs> um, he, he was very domineering, not afraid to yell or trying to intimidate people. Something it has been told, though, is that if you did stand up to him, he actually had a lot of respect for you. If you held your position and defended your beliefs, he would respect you. So here is where Apple began. Um, actually, this isn't true. Uh, everybody says, oh, in the early garage days. 
Um, the early days, as you know, were the sofa days. Um, the Villa Sarah apartments. Um, Waz had set up on his uh, couch, you know, the Apple, Apple One. I mean, it was it was amazing. It was all set up. But um, when Apple decided to start selling, uh, Paul Jobs, Steve's father, cleared out the garage so that um, they could go in there and start producing Apple One computers. Um, Back in 1976, when these first started selling, uh, the board sold for $666.66. Um, inflation adjusted, that's like $2,700. <laughs> some people thought it was some sort of <coughs> or anything like that. No, was loves repeating digits. His phone number in those days was 255-6666. Um, his phone number today, I believe, is a single digit repeated. Um, so. So, yeah, this is where they first started um, <coughs> manufacturing the Apple One, and um, this is actually where um, Apple Computer was first uh, incorporated. Here's their first logo. Um, Jobs is the one who really wanted to make the computer. Um, Woz was happy at HP, really loved designing calculators and loved people he worked with. And he loved doing this on the side, but he didn't want it to be his full-time occupation. Um, so Apple Incorporated on um, April 1st, 1976. I was um, in Steve Jobs' house. Uh, I was one of the witnesses there. Um, and uh, I mean, that's sort of how Apple originally got its start. And Jobs went all around the place starting to sell. That's how he learned to become a salesman. I didn't that start back then. Um, just for context, here's the Apple One display. Beautiful output of uh, green, 24 characters by, um, oh, no, 24 rows by 40 characters. Um, a massive output speed of 60 characters per second. Um, but, you know, it was pretty cool. Uh, there were no graphics. You can get a cassette as an add-on. But, so, we have an Apple One. Who knows boss is lost? Do it right the second time. <laughs> is that right? Not really. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> you told it to me. I wouldn't make it up. So, um, so the one was not designed as a computer. No, it was actually designed as a terminal. And then he added a microprocessor to it later. Okay. So um, designing the Apple One, he had all these great ideas on how to design a computer better. Because he went through it. So he designed the um, Apple Two. He wanted um, wanted color for games. That was real important to him because he loves playing games. Um, he wanted expandability. Um, knew how to use dynamic RAM and do it cheap and everything. Uh, incredibly way of uh, the I.O. was brilliant. I mean, having a memory space for each card. Uh, I mean, all of those things were revolutionary in their day. Um, a lot of people think this is uh, his greatest creation. I don't. I, th I think that the disk uh, card was his best design. Um, so, you know, the Apple II graphics, we all know what they look like. <laughs> Um, you know, low resolution, 48 by 48, 16 colors. Um, high res, 280 by 192, because that was NTSC. Couldn't get around what you could display on your television set. Um, for context, you know, your iPhone has 316 dots per inch. Uh, the Nexus 7 just announced has 321 dots per inch. Um, but, so, Woz designed this and built a um, uh, board of it. Um, he actually gave me the uh, schematics. I, uh, I built a board of it, got that working. He gave me the schematics of the Apple One, but I did such a horrible job that it never worked. He, he claims he had it working once at HP, but I was, I'm was i not a very good hardware person. So um, what happened is, is that um, with the Apple II, was um, wandered over to Jobs, and Jobs was you know, trying to get people interested in it, figuring this is what we'd sell next. And this guy named Mike Barkla came over, who was basically retired. Um, one of the things he liked to do as being retired was to mentor startups to help other people have the success that he had. Um, and he saw it, 
and he said, okay, this is a game changer. This is going to change the world. Um, nothing is, nothing is going to be the same. This is brilliant. And so he said, hey, let's make a real company out of this. And I'll give you guys money, but no more part-time. Everybody has to be full-time. And Woz didn't like that, actually. Woz wanted to stay at HP. He loved, uh, loved the Calculate Division, wanted to move to Corvallis with them. Um, and actually tried to give the HP, or the Apple II to HP. But HP basically said, no, it's a personal computer. That's a fad. that will go away. Um, <laughs> pretty sure they wish they could kind of take that back. But, um, and uh, there was a, a night late in 76 when I first experienced the Jobs Reality Distortion Field. Jobs called all of us that were Waz's friends and said, Steve is about to make the worst decision of his life. You know, we've got to do this for this company. It's going to be amazing. And, if it doesn't work out, he can go back to HP, but this is a once in a lifetime chance. And so he called all of Boss's friends, and then we all called you to apply pressure to uh, start Apple. And so obviously um, he did. So um, Apple Incorporated again. That's what I looked like a long, long time ago. Um, and one of the sad parts of Apple reincorporating is, is that with the first incorporation, Ron Wayne was a uh, uh, designer, draftsman on the, for Apple, uh, had a tech company. He said, you know what, I'm too tired of startups. I can't do another one. Um, you guys pay me back my $800 and we'll call it even. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really sad. I mean, 10% of Apple for $800. Kind of a discount. <laughs> At this time, I was working uh, before and after school. This is January of 77. Um, I would go in and work from like, you know, 5.30 to 7.30, go to school, come back and work. I was making a cool $3 an hour. Count them, three bucks an hour. Uh, but, you know, for those days, it was fine. And besides, I was doing what I loved. So I didn't actually need to be paid. Um, interestingly enough, another first in 1977. That's the first uh, successful TCPIP transmission. Kind of interesting. Um, Apple, yeah. <laughs> Your high school graduation. Yes. All five people who ran Apple for the first two years were at his graduation. Wow. <laughs> You're ruining my speech. So Apple II came into being. Rod Bolt designed the switching power supply um, because all power supplies in those days were bulky, heavy, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Rod did all of the analog. Rod was, is, a, is a brilliant engineer, um, kind of the analog equivalent of the was. I don't think he gets enough credit uh, for all the things he did. He's our first director of engineering, you know, a lot of stuff. Um, I was um, helping with raw routines and working on checkbook with Mike Markle, things like that. Um, this is how we packed um, the Apple II. I remember the blue hacking foam. Um, one interesting thing is that we got these this foam, and they were basically punch outs, right? They would cut it, but you would have to punch it out. And there was a whole bunch of foam left over. Um, Jobs and Cocky, Daniel Cocky, were living together, and so they started taking it home in the trunk of the car, and they basically filled the room full of this stuff. <laughs> they had a TV up in the corner so they could, you know, lounge around and watch it. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. The problem happened is that um, they would lounge around and they would watch TV, but then they would eat pizza and like crust and stuff yeah. fall down. And then mice discovered that. And cats discovered the mice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ended up not smelling so good. So. But uh, that's a pretty funny story about Jobs. Um, another interesting story about Apple II is that um, we didn't go with the standard manufacturing group. We actually hired, we went through this woman named Hilde, Hilde Lick. What we would do is we would get together a board and all the parts that went on the board and it would send off and literally housewives would put them together while they were watching TV. That was how original manufacturing was done. Always joke that we had so many 
made during the dome show. So, <laughs> probably better than actually watching the show, to be honest. Yeah. So, so this brings us up to April of 77, when we um, Apple II launched at the West Coast Computer Fair. Um, everybody was working there. You know, this is all well documented. You can read about that. Um, but um, pretty sure it was this fair that a more interesting computer came out. Um, in those days, there was a company called Zilog that had this processor called the Z8. And in order to be cool, all the marketing hotness, you had to use Z in all of your names. <laughs> and so Waz, being the incredible prankster he is, thought, wouldn't it be fun if we announced a computer that didn't exist? So that's how we came up with the Zaltair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nobody, we didn't admit for years afterwards um, this. Um, I mean, there, you know, I mean, we used basic, right? Because, you know, you get to use the Z word. Um, there were things I was really supplied, surprised at. A computer engineer's dream. All electronics are on a single PC card, even the 18 slot motherboard. And what a motherboard. <laughs> really? People fell for this? Um, one of, uh, I remember one that we laughed at a lot was, um, you won't find the Zaltair in any store. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the uh, few uh, honest things on here. Yeah, we had the uh, registered trademarks and note and all this kind of stuff. Um, we had this uh, performance benchmark table, which was all numbers we just made up. I mean, they were just pulled out of thin categories. Yeah, I mean, categories, you know, I.O. I mean, software and reliability. Um, it was an incredible joke. Um, one of my favorite memories, though, is that Jobs got a copy of one of these. And we were in his office, and he says, no, no, this is real. And then he starts looking at the number and says, hey, we did pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> at, that point, at that point, I had to drag Waz out of Jobs' office because he was about to lose it. <laughs> As was I. Um, it was a couple of years later that uh, Waz fessed up, and John's had a twelve years later. John's had a, uh, 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 had a uh, frame actually in his office. For a while. I actually gave him a frame copy for his birthday photo. Oh, did you? So um, uh, we um, thought it would be a fun prank, so we produced a few. Uh, I think it was like ten thousand or something like that. So. Um, in April for $600. Um, the problem is, is that users kept trying them. So, um, so um, finally we started selling the complete system in June of 77, a full 4,096 bytes of memory. Um, all cassette storage sold for like $1,298. Uh, in today's dollars, that's like $4,850. That's, it was not cheap. Um, we took uh, trade-ins of Apple Ones toward this because every single Apple One we got in freed up Waz because he was the only one who understood the Apple One and could support it. You know, whenever there was a question on Apple One, it always had to go to Waz. So he was the entire support department for Apple. Um, we also at that time shipped the uh, uh, released the Waz pack for uh, distribution by Call Apple because. We didn't really have any documentation. We wanted people to know as much as they could and do as much as they could with it. Um, this is June of 77. I am uh, 17 now and a junior in high school. I couldn't take any more high school, so I graduated here early. Um, and uh, this is kind of unusual. I had um, the entire executive staff of Apple at my graduation. Um, they all signed a graduation card. I think I also got 50 bucks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was, even then I realized, eh, that's probably unusual. <laughs> so, now, um, we basically get to the 
point where uh, I'm working at Apple full time. And every day started with a tradition. We would walk down to Bob's Big Boy every day. Um, I don't know why, because all we do is get there and complain. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how bad the coffee yeah. was? Why do we keep going? But, <laughs> we, uh, we had a little fun at Bob's Big Boy. Um, one day we put a uh, little insert of the menus that said, uh, for your convenience, dot, 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 the management, and staple to it was some Alka-Seltzer. <laughs> <laughs> Another time we put like something like Bromo-Seltzer into the sugar dispenser so that the next person who had coffee and poured it in would have like a volcano. <laughs> Reacted really something else, but uh, that was that's how we started every day. Um, so now we're getting to uh, June of '77. Um, we go to the National Computer Conference in Dallas, um, and you know we actually have a full computer to demo. And what we would do is we would demo uh, Breakout, right? Because it was the coolest demo we had, and people understood it and loved it. Uh, but what we discovered is that people were really uncoordinated and lame, and um, it got annoying to watch them keep losing uh, the game. So what we did is we said, hey, the best way to play this is to try and keep the paddle under the ball, and, and, and that's the best way to win. And so then they would start playing, and we would put it into automatic play mode. So they had nothing to do with it. And I mean, literally, it would go on for minutes. They would think they were the, like a video game expert, you know? And, I don't want jiggle so they didn't know it was perfect. Well, that's, that's what we did. Actually, we first started just making it perfect. Then we added the jiggle to make people nervous when it got near the, when the bottom of the battle. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was pretty awesome. What's that? I actually did that at the Homework Club. Oh, oops. Great, strong, great, great, funny game. Didn't realize you had to really want to
of 77, and uh, you know, I'm not happy with my $3 an hour. So it turns out that every after so every morning we would go to Bob's Big Point, and then every afternoon um, we would walk over to 7-Eleven to get a uh, candy bar and some snacks, what stuff like that. Um, well, the problem is that we had to walk all the way up to the street, back to 7-Eleven, and then back up the street, back down. If we could have just gone straight, it would have been like, you know, 50 yards. So Waz told me that if I could shorten the route to 7-Eleven, <laughs> that I would get a raise. raise. And uh, sure enough, one day, came in, had some lumber on his desk, and I got a raise to 350. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, this is now getting near the end of 77, you know, we're growing super fast. Here's a, um, the hand-drawn map of the uh, family building we're going to move into. Um, see everybody labeled there. Um, one thing is, is that when Apple was started, we actually only thought we'd make like maybe 10,000 Apple Twins. I mean, you know, how many people really want a personal computer? So. We didn't really plan ahead for the kind of growth that we had. Um, but also near the end of 77, everybody was complaining about the cassette because it was so slow. I mean, we, I don't know what it was, a few hundred baht or something like that, I remember exactly, but it was pretty slow. Um, so this is when um, Waz designed the Disc 2 controller, uh, which I think is the most amazing thing. In those days, uh, Controllers usually had like 50 to 70 chips. Uh, I mean, they were these huge, complicated ports, and well, I figured out how to make it in eight chips. Um, I'll never forget when we started uh, showing this to people, they would literally look under the table trying to figure out where the rest of it was. <laughs> <laughs> they just couldn't believe it. So, um, uh, Waz designed it in December of 77. And then over the Christmas vacation, we worked together day and night to try and get the software together to um, actually be able to show it. Because there was a show coming up in um, uh, January, CES in Las Vegas, which is you know where we were supposed to launch the disc and had to work. It was quite important. So we um, went to Vegas. This is actually where we stayed. It used to be called the Villa Roma. It's now called the Broadway Inn. Um, wasn't a very good place, but whatever. Um, the problem is, is that the software wasn't done. So we knew we could finish it because there wasn't that much more to do. So what we would do is we would work at the show floor for like an hour or so and get a next feature working. And then Waz took me out and taught me how to gamble for like the <laughs> next level. Um, I think I won like $35 or something like that that night. So cool money, yeah, and craps. Um, yeah, still want a crap table at work. Haven't gotten one. <laughs> um, we almost had a disaster at the end, actually. We uh, copied, we were doing changes, then we would back up the disk, and we ended up backing up the wrong direction right at the end. <laughs> so, but we managed to recreate the work, and it launched at uh, CES and huge success. People really couldn't believe the design, couldn't believe that that was it. Um, I think one of the other things is we ordered uh, breakfast for everybody at like 6 a.m. and left the little uh, things hanging on their doors. <laughs> so they weren't, uh, they weren't friends with us. <laughs> um, and uh, I can't remember if it was this show or it was the National Computer Conference actually, but um, everybody the next morning, because everybody had to work the booth and standing for eight hours was actually kind of painful. Everybody the next morning was complaining about how their feet hurt, except Chops. Chops said, oh, no, my feet feel great. How come? He says, well, what you do is you take your foot, you put it in the toilet, you flush it like several times, and it's like a really nice foot massage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've still never tried that. <laughs> I'll have to go on his word unless someone here wants to, you know, experiment. So, Anyways, that gets us to the point where we're producing the um, Apple uh, disk drive. And uh, I mean, this is really what uh, uh, catapulted us to uh, success. We would go through like a year's supply in two months. Um, you know, Shugart, Shugart was providing all the drives for us, and they saw how many we were selling. They said, cool. 
Uh, so for your next contract, the price goes up, um, which of course, that's not supposed to happen. So that's actually when we went to Alps, and that started the whole Japanese connection on uh, disk drives, because Sugar was trying to rip us off. Um, so also around this time, we had uh, celebrated Job's birthday, and we uh, had a florist deliver a white rose wreath that said, um, happy birthday from someone looking over your shoulder. <laughs> made Steve nervous. <laughs> he tried like the Dickens to get it out of the florist, but uh, you know, find out. That was uh, that was actually Scotty, uh, Mike Scott, the first president, and myself and a couple of them. Mm -hmm. um, so this is about the time we start having just uh, enormous growing pains. We have like multiple buildings. Um, you know, a good part of it is that we got a lot more rigorous about uh, engineering. Uh, we discovered that we didn't have an authoritative Apple II schematic that everybody believed. So um, Wendell and Bill Fernandez uh, reverse engineered the thing we were shipping to make sure that they had accurate <laughs> You have records that were like 95, 99% accurate, but no one was positive that, you know, it was exactly what we were shipping. Went through a piece of the record and when he changed the background, he can tell us what his changes have been. Mm -hmm. So, um, I can't believe it to change certain things. Uh, okay. So, um, the bad is that we started bringing at this time professional management, you know, MBAs. We were having constant reorgs. If my boss calls, get his name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, it was not fun. Um, you know, everybody said, oh, the Apple II is a toy. We're going to show you how to make a professional computer. That'll be the Apple III. Mm -hmm. um, around this time, actually, we actually started getting um, knockoffs coming in from um, uh, China. And um, one time, apparently, 10,000 showed up at the Los Angeles Port Authority. And Apple got a call said, are these yours? You know, they say that, you know, there's no copyright infringement that they've built this all themselves. Well. Was had put in an Easter egg into the ROM that at a certain address you went in G and it would just commit copyright Apple computer over and over again. So <laughs> that's how we got them. Let's bring to uh, Scotty. So we also put copyright notices on every chip because I went to that point. Yeah, but the uh, the Chinese took those off. <laughs> <laughs> but we were copyright. We did have a Oh no, I know, I, I know. I mean, it's just that people tried to knock us <coughs> off from you know basically the. Uh, flagrantly, you know, violate the copyright, but they couldn't. Um, so now we get to one of the, well, <laughs> I don't even know where to go with this one. Um, we produced the Apple III. Uh, to me, this is the ultimate design by committee. Uh, nobody actually owned this thing. It was, there, it was intended to replace the Apple II, and there was even an Apple II mode, but the marketing wouldn't let us put any of the Apple III features into the Apple II, like we couldn't have like lowercase or things like that. Um, I still think um, my quote that's been publicized is still the most accurate, which is that the Apple III was kind of like this big, massive orgy. And at the end, there's this bastard child. And everybody says, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I talked about the Apple III like it was all bad. It wasn't. Um, I got a really cool pencil holder. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <coughs> um, let's see, somewhere around this time also, we um, created the spreadsheet. Worked on this with uh, Boz and Gil Banks. Uh, it was an alternative to um, uh, BizCalc and basically had super fast numerics. Uh, super fast boot. I mean, it was it was actually pretty cool. Um, it was. Uh, Waz says it's the only time he saw the executive staff cheer. The problem is, is that uh, we couldn't afford to piss off uh, personal software because they were producing VisiCalc for the Apple III, and so um, uh, the product ended up being killed. Uh, and then I generously interpreted a comment that Jobs made to say, oh, we can give it away. So I gave it up to uh, the Puget Sound group. They started distributing it, and then Apple again freaked out and said, no, 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 no. Uh, and they ended up buying it back. So 
unfortunate that it never, it never made, uh, made it out into the uh, light of day. Um, an interesting fact that most people don't know is that the disk drive um, actually led to Lisa. So remember I talked about how Shugart raised our price and we went to uh, Japan to get an alternative. We thought, okay, what happens if they come after us? Well, let's take an investment from the holding company, which was Xerox. So Xerox invested in Apple because we wanted to make sure that if they sued us, they'd be suing themselves. Uh, you know, a, a pretty reasonable strategy. And that is how um, it led to the demo uh, that, you know, was attended by Jobs and Atkinson and all of those. So um, that led to the uh, Lisa. I mean, when, when Jobs and Atkinson saw the demo of the SAR, they knew it was the future. They knew it was the way things were going to go. Um, and so really just thought, you know, this is the way we should do it. Jobs at this point um, had quite a reputation as a troublemaker, uh, as pretty insufferable to work with. And so the Lisa project was actually named after his illegitimate daughter as kind of a poke in the eye. And then he was uh, kicked off the project because everybody didn't like working with him. That led to the Macintosh project. Um, he took it over and picked his team. Those of us that worked on it, we were either a hero or shit daily. Uh, it was quite an emotional roller coaster. Uh, we had a shirt that said working 70 hours a week and loving it. Uh, Andy Hertzfeld always thought it should have been changed to working 80 hours a week and getting really, really, really tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, that went on for a couple of years. And then we reached, uh, this is what I wrote. Um, you know, we take it for granted, you take it for granted now, but in those days there weren't any graphical word processors where you could change fonts, adjust margins, and all that stuff happened dynamically on the screen. It was, it was kind of magic. Um, and uh, one of the amazing parts is that we had to ship, so everything was lined up to ship on January 24th. We had to ship January 24th. And one of the jobs insisted that uh, we had to have a Mac in every store, it had to be downloadable, customers had to be able to buy it. The problem is that, of course, the software was running behind schedule. I mean, everything was assembly, uh, very brittle, very difficult to work with, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code. We worked out that if we produce the software at 6 a.m. on January 19th, someone could drive it over to the duplication facility. They would literally start up the disk duplication process, put it in the boxes, shrink wrap the boxes, FedEx the boxes out to all of the computer stores, and we would make January 24th. But I mean, there was no more margin of error. We'd already gone through all of the deadlines we were supposed to get at that point. Um, so we um, worked, and on, I mean, I was literally working probably 20, 22 hours a day, sleeping under the desk. Everybody else was too. And January 19th at 2 a.m., we put together what we thought was going to be our final release for Canada. The problem is, is that we started testing it, and literally nothing worked. It was a horrible, horrible failure. Um, and we went into total and complete panic mode because we only had, you know, a couple more hours to produce this, or else we were going to have the wrath of jobs on us. That's not a good thing. Um, we actually finally produced the software at 5.54 a.m. The software had six minutes of testing before ship. <laughs> uh, it, was um, it was great. So then, you know, it led to... Where's the sound?
January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Still one of my favorite uh, commercials. Um, as you see, January 24th was quite hardwired. <laughs> <laughs> It still amazes me that actually the board of directors hated that um, ad. Uh, they tried to sell our Super Bowl time, but were unable to, so that's the only reason it ran during Super Bowl. Wow. Yeah, that's a vision. Mm -hmm. um, so, the question comes, you know, what was so special? What was, how, how, did, how did Apple succeed when so many companies did? You know, and that's the interesting part. Um, I would have to say that the first thing is that great people make all the difference. Um, you have to put together people who are smart, <coughs> driven, passionate about what they're doing. I mean, when we succeeded, it was driven by individuals, not by committees. When we failed, it was committees. Um, you know, we had, we had a lot of great people. Um, we also, I mean, roles didn't matter. People just did because they cared about the company. They did whatever they needed to do. Um, in the very early days, we had, we were shipping Apple with a breakout checkbook and I think some other demo. We didn't have a cassette duplicator. So our president, Mike Scott, would actually sit at the front and he would type save, get all the uh, recorders. He would have like six recorders hanging off of it. Get them all going, hit return for save, wait until it finished, and then press stop again. And you know, I mean, so it wasn't like everybody, anybody really was better than anyone else. Everybody just did what had to be done. Um, everybody was involved. Uh, this is the back of the uh, inside of the Macintosh. You know, there's lots of signature there, down there below it. But everybody. Jobs wanted everybody to know that they were personally invested in this, that when this box goes out, a little bit of you is going out as well, right? So it's not just a product you're producing for people out there. This is something that you should take pride in. Um, the other thing is that we made something we wanted. Uh, as I told you at the beginning, all I wanted was my own computer. That's what led to all of this. Um, and uh, I've had the privilege to work at two other companies that were same, uh, founded on the same principle <coughs> today. Um, Pyramidi are one an efficient uh, place to trade. Um, you know, the legend goes that he wanted to sell his girlfriend's Pez dispensers. Not clear whether that's accurate or not, but still makes a good story. He made something he wanted. Um, Square, where I currently work, um, was made because the co-founder, Jim Kelby, couldn't sell a piece of glass art because he couldn't take credit cards. It's like, why not? This is something we want. So I think that the best companies make things that they want, not to satisfy a market need, but to satisfy their own personal need. Because then it matters. Then it really matters to you in a much more personal way. Um, <coughs> another reason it succeeded is that uh, we didn't know it was impossible. Um, we really didn't. So this is actually a, a picture, a, a poster inside Square. Um, for example, the Xerox Star, they saw the demo and went away, and Bill couldn't figure out how they did it, how, how they made it so that windows could overlap and stuff. And so he created QuickDraw, which had beautiful random regions. You could make any kind of region. Um, later on, we found out that Xerox considered that impossible. Everything was square. So we just did it because we didn't know better. Um, Was well, this controller? I mean, eight chips? Are you kidding? It's crazy. It's stupid. Nobody can do that. Uh, you know, doing WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get with the Mac right. Nobody thought that was possible. Um, another thing that went into uh, success, and this actually is Jobs' uh, legacy, is that form and function were equal partners. Uh, you know, on the left. You see what an Altair 8800 looked like. On the right is an Apple II. You know, on the bottom is an IBM PC. There's a Macintosh. It's pretty clear that it wasn't just making it work. It was making it work and making it beautiful. It was making it insanely great. All aspects of it. Not just the software, not just the hardware, not just the case, all of it. All of it had to work together. The thing is that we had to aim for perfection. Um, 
we had a Bissendorfer and a BMW motorcycle in the lobby at Bantley um, because Jobs considered them examples of a beautiful melding of form and function, considered it nearly perfect. Um, I also hear that Waz borrowed Bill Fernandez's motorcycle and learned how to ride in the uh, uh, Earth parking lot. And it fell over and it broke a uh, beer. Yeah. <laughs> So, I did get a BMW when I wrote an example for about 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else made it successful? Uh, we believed in breaking the rules. You know, uh, we had the pirate flag flying over the back. Uh, jobs quote, you know, it's more fun to be a pirate than join the Navy. Individuals matter. Don't join the crowd. You know, make a difference. We didn't know what we couldn't do, but what we knew is that we really wanted change things. And I would say that the single most important factor that went into um, Apple's success was a focus on changing the world. It wasn't made to be a quick flip to someone who would fire us. It wasn't made for an IPO. It wasn't made to make us famous. We did it out of passion and what we loved. So, you know, you may not be laws or jobs. You may not be a Larry Page, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, Jeff Bezos, Pierre Miniar, Jack Dorsey, but you can make a difference. So, on that, you make a difference. Hey. Uh, uh, uh. that it would start getting bogged down in politics. So literally it was all done at my house. Mike that was, Scott. Mike Scott set it up. Yep. And um, <coughs> there was, uh, during the production of that, I reached 36 cups of coffee a day. <laughs> it was intended to be, you know, we wanted to produce this as fast as we could. Because actually VisiCalc was sort of holding us hostage, our personal software. Because they say, oh, we have VisiCalc, so you need to do this, not this. You know, we wanted to prove that we could produce something as good or better and do it quickly. And I think we succeeded. Yeah. Could you uh, describe or tell me something about what the boss's one away was, where that fit in, and also the Bell and Howell, you know, especially produced Apple II buses. Okay, where the boxes went away? Where the That's a, the boxes went away was a German computer that had a dual CPU. Oh, Oh, um, okay. So we tried to work with Bell and Howell. That didn't um, that didn't work out. Uh, we then signed up with IT and T. Um, they were actually supposed to promote the Apple II internationally um, and only stay in the education market. And then when Apple went over there, we discovered that actually they'd been selling to a lot of businesses. So you know that was that was a problem. Uh, the uh, how the I don't know the other one. It was a German, German clone or German machine, yeah. both a Z80 and a 6502 microprocessor. Really? Yeah. The run is Apple II software. I wonder they got the ROM, the ROM from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't get a copy. The scuttlebutt with the bosses went away was it was 100% clone out of the book. and. Randy mentioned the, well, we were 99% sure on the schematics. Well, the book wasn't exactly right. So what they made didn't exactly work 100% the way the idiosyncrasies of the actual product being produced worked. So while they had their own machine, it was not It was 100% clone, 101% compatible. <laughs> Questions, too? Sure, but if any, why? Any 
questions for Waz? I guess there's probably. Yeah. Can you tell a more about your role in the two and DOS? Oh, um, sure. I mean, so we wrote. I mean, we wrote all of the. Let me tell this. And the first time ever they were going to let Apple IIs into Las Vegas, the Consumer Electronics Show. And only three people were going. Marketing, Mike Markla, sales, Gene Carter, and Steve Jobs. And I'm, I'm too shy to say, please pay the money to send me so I can see the lights of Vegas. I've never been there. So I, so I, I, I raised my hand. A dumb thought just popped in my head. I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? Now, the show was two weeks away. <laughs> floppy disk is like a man near project. And I just thought, if I get a floppy disk made, I get to go to Vegas. <laughs> that took two weeks to do it. I had never worked with any disk drive in my life, never studied them, never studied, worked with a disk operating system or studied it, didn't know a thing. I just knew if I could get something to say, run, checkbook, we get to go there. I sat down with weird ideas, never out of a book. I didn't know how disk drives were made, disk controllers were made. And I started studying the shoe our thing, took out their chips. I said, if we got a processor, we can do our own signals. Ran them straight into the input heads. And, and now, now, for two weeks, Randy was the only one <clears throat> that came in every single day, including Christmas and New Year's, except Randy skipped New Year's. But I was there every day okay. for the two weeks. And we got to go to Las Vegas, and we showed a working disk drive. And, and yeah. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah. But, but when I was all done, you know, I had little ideas of, we kind of needed some smartness in it. And, there's an idea called a state machine, a little ROM that holds a code, a current state that you're in, and a PROM that decides what the next state will be, depending on inputs coming from the disk and all. Two little $1 chips, and some, and God knows it worked out. Now, I, when I was all done, I was sure I didn't have a disk controller that could do the things computers do, financial stuff. I don't like finance. I never, I've never used Apple's app, stock app to this day. I don't want to go near, near financial numbers. So I didn't. I knew that my disk controller wouldn't do all the things, but it would run a game. It would run color map, you know, on the screen. You could type, you know, R for run, and then the name of the program. And um, and like Randy said, yeah, we finished it up that that night. Yeah. In Las Vegas, in, in Las the convention Vegas. center. In the, in the convention center. But yeah, no, Randy was just part part and party to the whole the whole development of the disk drive all the way through. Just the two of us. We had a little office away from everybody else in our first office complex. It was Randy and I alone and John Draper when he worked there on his phone board. Right. Um, in terms of the DOS, uh, we wanted to make our own DOS, but you know, once again, it was a matter we didn't have enough time. So um, that's why we got Shepardson Microsystems uh, involved. And you, and I, you and I were actually working on trying to come up with a definition of an operating system yep. and floating point basic. Yeah, so we were trying to do everything and couldn't, right? There were just too many things to be done. So when Bill Gates walked in the door with a floating point basic, it's like, oh, yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> there are other things. Exactly. Unfortunately, I think that license was a five year license and we were screwed at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, did you write the, the first one? Yes. Very nice Very well done. Uh, in design and built the Apple One, and Apple Two. Were other people working on the same problem? Was there a perceived no. problem you solved, or did you uniquely have yes. a vision of well, what people working on the idea? Can a computer be affordable? Our homebrew computer club was a whole bunch of like technical people, but they were wirers. I wired together, soldered every wire to build my prototype. The Apple One was a real quick one. If I finally saw the formula for an affordable computer that could run basic, that meant you had to have 4K of RAM. All the kits, like Altairs, were going with static RAMs that cost four times as much as dynamic. But dynamic RAMs were harder to program. If you looked at an Intel data sheet, they showed a microprocessor with some address pins running over to the address pins on a static RAM. They showed data pins going to the data pins on the static RAM. So that's what all these companies did. They just copied the Intel data sheet. Nobody was real. They weren't real designers and engineers. I sat down and said, I always want the fewest parts and the lowest cost. And that led to static memory, where you had to, every 2,000th of a second, you had to get in every single bit of the memory had to be refreshed. But I, what I did was I took the video counters that are counting horizontal and vertical, 
and just swap them in as enough occasional counters to hit the RAM the right ways to, um, to like in the Apple One during refresh time. The Apple II was just serendipity everywhere because by then the RAMs were two megahertz, the processor was one megahertz. The processor could get in for a cycle and then the video could get in. They could both share the same memory. But bringing the terminal, instead of having a terminal on a wire, putting the terminal right there, that you could change a million dots a second on the screen with simple microprocessor programming. So that was key. And then the color was something really strange because in those days, color was analog. Television was analog. The Apple II didn't put out a code that meant red and a code that meant green. It put out the whole NTS signal for the colors. That was, um, it's all right in there. Well, in analog television, you had sine waves, the mathematics of it in all the books of engineering. Sine waves of red, green, and blue at different amplitudes all mixed with op-amp circuitry cost a thousand bucks. And here's this little one dollar ship register shifting the digital data around right out of memory. Pop it out of memory, shift it around, and it shows up as color. And it wasn't ever in any book done that way. It was so strange and different. But when you don't know what you're doing, but you know that you need you want it. So it's the personal want. I wanted to go to Vegas. We got a floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a computer. We got a computer. Yeah. We wanted a computer with graphics. And, and to this day, if you want something graphics. personally, you'll find, and if you're smart enough, you'll find all the elements you need to build it, or you'll find help from others. But don't, don't read it out of a book and copy it. Yeah. I used to love to go to these companies that had Apple II clones at the trade shows. I'd say, but I'm your chief engineer. And then when the press gathered, they'd say, yes, you're our chief engineer. I'd walk away happy, but I should have demanded a salary. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah. So uh, what do you want now? You wanted, a, you wanted to go to Vegas, you got a disk drive, you wanted a personal computer. What do you no, want now? The whole, the whole trend over our history, you can start with too, the, the beauty of the case, and Steve Jobs took that into account, but it was making computers more human. I want to talk to a computer the way I talk to you guys. You understand what I'm saying? And a computer still doesn't understand, Siri still doesn't understand me right. But I want it to get more and more like a real human. It's got our senses, hearing, sight, movement, like the inner ear. It knows where it is with GPS, and I don't know that when I wake up. <laughs> so it's getting more like a little friend. I want it to be the best friend someday that uh, you know knows your heart and soul better than the humans. Yeah. So, so by stripping out, sorry, so by stripping out the chip from the shoe cover, that 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 would require have you got to go mechanism to oh, no, no. I studied the shoe guard circuitry, never having worked with any disk drive. Studied what their chips did. They had a language that came in on a cable. The language told the disk to do certain things, but those chips just translated them down to pulses that changed direction every four microseconds or eight. Right. And so the whole thing is, why don't I just generate that right in the computer? The host computer can rewrite software to control those signals. And that allowed us to increase the density and the speed of the disks over time. For example, they normally had to go track to track, 15 milliseconds. Made a horrible sound when the disk drives moved, you know, in those days. And I said, well, wait a minute, the concept of physics, you know, it didn't come out of any book. concept of physics, when you push something, the same force, it goes faster, 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 and then you can slow down before you hit the end. So I just wrote a little timing table that accelerated the, uh, the, um, accelerated the speed, 15 milliseconds for the first track change, 14 milliseconds for the next, faster and faster, halfway there, then it, then it started slowing down. So it didn't overrun the destination. And the sound of the disc two is one of my favorite sounds ever in computers. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> and, um, but, but it was, uh, yeah, and I mean, it was just try a little concept that makes a lot of physics based on physics, but only because you could rewrite it in the processor. If you were stuck with that disc language on the cable, you had to go at their speeds. Right. And that's so what allowed us to do like 11 sectors when we went to Las Vegas. That's what we had was the original 11 sectors. And then we went and to 13. Had, yeah, but they only had 10. If you, if you use their uh, electronics, it was only 10 sectors. Huh. We went to 10, then 13. We moved it up to 13, yeah, by um, letting 4 microsecond pulses, 8 microsecond, and 12. Mm -hmm. A little hairy, but on the analog side. Can you uh, comment on um, you went to order your first batch of shoe guard mechanisms and they shipped you mostly damaged units or broken units and yeah you got, because and they you did, got them fixed they did they uh, yeah they thought they were screwing us and it turns out they were actually doing us a favor because we didn't need all the stuff that they usually had right so that's how they got working yeah that was 
our relationship with Sugar wasn't very good even back then. <laughs> they thought that oh, these guys think they can, you know, do this clever stuff. We'll just send them a bunch of, of bad stuff. And actually, it won't work. We had one building in Cupertino where we were assembling the all too. Yep. So, well, the in fact, we did all our manufacturing of the Apple II's in Cupertino in the early days. Soldering the Apple II boards together and the peripheral boards and everything. But it was the least group. came with sockets. They, were, they had sockets already. Yeah. 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 But all the other analogs they had to solder. That's true. The, I'm talking about the little boards, the they said two boards. I'm not thinking. I don't oh. think they did the Apple II. Yeah, but plugging the chips in the Apple II is pretty easy too. Right. You paid to see Jobs Dog, the daughter. <laughs> no, no, they were soldering the other boards that we came up with. Yeah. Um, you know, once it's sort of shift attention to the Macintosh like after that point, um, were you at all, either of you at all involved in Apple II, like what was happening with the Apple II line after that? Mm -hmm. I was. I was. Mm -hmm. um, I went, um, I had a plane crash, went to college, got my degree, um, and my diploma says Rocky Raccoon Clark, because <laughs> my name was known, but not my face, so I pulled it off. Then I came, did some rock concerts, and came back to Apple, walked into the Apple II division, I'd like a job as an engineer. And uh, we, by then, the Apple III had been recognized as a failure, and we had to, we had only we had no project. We we're trying to kill the Apple II. Yeah, we had it was one, terrible. One project when I showed up for the Apple II in this whole huge company, one engineering project was for some screw network system. And all of a sudden, we had this John Scully join us the day I did. Got moved the Apple III to a different place. Every single person in Apple had an Apple III on their desk. The company had worked for one or two years to try to make this computer successful, but because it failed out of the box, hardware, software failures, you get a bad name, you get a bad name. <coughs> So it was a great, it was a good, much better computer than what it was selling as. Yeah, but you know, you. you know, the quality of something doesn't necessarily overtake the market. With the Apple II, we didn't have to overtake anything. It was a blind market. But with the Apple III, we kind of had to displace Apple IIs gradually, but we should have put a lot more emphasis into milking the Apple II. So then we developed the Apple II X, which became the Apple II GS, right. which was a, a, a real good advance, and you know, still had the color in. And then the Macintosh failed so badly out of the box that it was for three more years after that, all the revenues were still from the Apple II. Yep. The one product was 10 years, first 10 years out of all the revenues. So it was lucky. I was lucky. If you have a product like that, you get a lot of restarts. <laughs> and we had to work really hard to build the Macintosh market. The Macintosh was just beautiful. It was the future, and I was down in Xerox Park with those guys too. But um, but it still had to work to get the, some software to be useful. Yeah. And, and it wasn't so color. Price. And it wasn't color, which was strange. My opinion is the Lisa was the great computer, and we got the Lisa back when we got OS X. Now we really had a great computer, but the Lisa had underpinnings of a real Unix-like operating system. And and if we just waited five years and said, let's wait until it's human price, so we can make this machine human price, we would have owned the world maybe. Yeah. If the Mac had come out and did $995, you know, history would be a lot different. Uh, but they tried to... It was cost of RAM. Cost of RAM in those days. The RAM cost 5000 at least it cost 10000 the, the, the Mac came out later and worked and worked to use less RAM, because that's where you save the money. And that's how you have to think, how do I save the money? But it was still a pretty expensive computer and didn't do anything right away from the software, so it takes a while for sales to build. Yeah. How far were you all with it that uh, the computer be kept accessible to programmers to work in the DOS and work in the... Uh, well, that's always critical. No, but you could get out I of the book. I had learned, when Randy learned, we were young, we stumbled into machines and got to play with them. Yeah. And it was so fun. And I wanted this to be a machine that other young people could discover because now they could afford to be near one or have one of them. Discover this is how computers work. I love this. This is my life. And and Mike Scott, our president, was very much into publishing all the documentation we had, schematic software, the was pack, and that um, that was really I just wanted other people to have a chance to learn, oh my gosh, I love this computer world. That was very important to me. Yeah. And it was a very open machine. And when you think about later machines, even the Macintosh was very close. Not to software. 
the hardware. Not just software. You know, and even the iPhone finally opened up the apps, so that was software open as to change our lives so much. But our big, I think every time Apple got open in a way, it hugely expanded. The next Apple II in Apple was iPod. We wrote iTunes for Windows, so we could sell it to everyone in the world. So that level of focus, but we don't write iTunes for Android. You know, I mean, our iPhones had 30 pin connectors. We want an iPod yet to buy an iPhone. That was the thing that we should really think. We own, we own music, we should put it to the world. Some shares, um, and I mean, actually, um, according to Mike Scott, actually, uh, everyone was supposed to either have shares or have the ability to buy them at, you know, at the public offering price. And there's some people who claim that that wasn't true. Uh, I don't know. I have conflicting sources. So, but yeah, most people had, um, most everybody had some number of shares. There were a few. Uh, uh, Remember the boss plan? Yeah, yeah. That was uh, when it was tried to. We're a different uh, category. Yeah, we're a different sort of more important category. <laughs> you know, it's you have a few people around that are working with you side by side. Doesn't matter if they're in high school. That's the, that's the company wouldn't have started without you know that. Right. But then later on, uh, Laws sold uh, shares to a bunch of people at a really low price. Before we went public, yeah, I sold some of my own personal shares at a very low price to people in engineering and marketing, and they all pretty much got a house out. But I felt that you should, everyone should be an owner of the company because I came from Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard, every quarter, they had profit sharing. And you got some shares, so you'd feel like an owner of the company. Right. And we didn't have that at Apple. Well, we had some examples, and not enough, though. But we didn't have profit sharing. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the hook to get the uh, disk operating system to, to communicate with BASIC uh, going through the the interpreter for the, the tokens in BASIC, that was something you came up with? Yeah, yeah, that was the only way we could hook it into everything that we had, right? Because we wanted it to work not only with Applesoft, but with integer BASIC and with anything else. Yeah, it was like, yeah, just send your characters through here and it'll work. That's how the whole, you know, wasn't that well, unique to amongst all the others? Of the Apple II, not the disk operating system. Right. Here, yeah, that's how BASIC. The hardware operating system. Could convert input and output to any slot, yeah. right. and that was just enough to hook in the disk drive. And was that unique with the Apple II? I mean, the other computer manufacturers no, didn't never. do it that way. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> never, never done that way. The reason I did it was I had two chips that decoded eight slots worth of hardware addresses, and eight slots worth of software addresses. Everybody else had to put a board in that had about five chips to make sure the address matched what you dialed for that board in that slot on the Altair system. So you get up eight, eight boards would have 40 chips the old way and had two my way, so I just wanted to show off. <laughs> <laughs> so it turned out yes, it turned out important. It turned out important. Yeah. So so part of it was that actually it sounds like the Apple II's slots were more interchangeable than everybody else's slots. Oh, absolutely. Were. You could put a disk drive into slot five and say PR number five. Right. Or into six and say PR number yeah. six. Right. Oh yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, but, but then you can always get around anything too with peaks and bumps. Because when Randy described the phone board that John Draper did, I wanted a phone system that could turn in an answering machine like my dial generator. The phone company had just been deregulated. You could plug your own stuff in the phone lines. And peaks and posts let you peek and up, open up, in, and then run a test, and it would say, is this the tone that's coming back? Modems weren't going to listen for, for busy signals for 12 years still. But people didn't like Draper. I mean, Randy and I kind of liked working with him. It was fun. But the people in the company didn't like him, so they wouldn't put out his board. We, we could design it, but then they'd have to manufacture it, have to put it in production. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, can you share some uh, perspective on the GS Plus, the marketing GS that was never released in the actual line of the Apple II at Apple? I actually cannot. Um, I believed very much that the processor, the 60,000 in the Macintosh, was really more the, um, the wave of the future and we couldn't match it in speed. The designer of the 6502 and 6516s and those processors had plans to move it up to faster, wider buses, but 
um, I kind of believe that the Macintosh was the future myself. And I also left the company to design, do a new startup. A little remote control, you know, you do some remote control, that was too fun. So I wasn't around during that time frame to really give me the answers. Could you go into the, uh, uh, maybe the start of the Apple IIx and, and how that sure. came to be? Okay. Inst the Macintosh is, is, um, um, is, is, let's see, Macintosh actually wasn't quite out yet, but we had to revive the Apple II projects over the Apple III. We had to come up with something. And from my experience with dynamic memories, you can give it what's called a column address first, and you can give it row addresses and strobe a bunch really fast. So if you have bytes that are in a row, you can get them out really fast. So I tried to be efficient to how can we get five times the throughput of the computer, five times the speed. And in reality, because your programs are in one set of address space and your data's in another, you know, the processor's going out to one area first for part of the program and one area to memory, one area here. You'd almost have to have two separate parts of memory to make that work. And so it didn't work out again. We only got 25% efficiency. But that was the Apple II X. And then they analyzed it uh, in the business side of the company that was only going to sell 2000 a month and that wasn't enough to make it a product. And it still was um, more NTSC based. So the team converted it over to the GS with graphics, you know, real digital graphics and sound. But remember, it was a color, it was color. It had a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> just slow. But the processor, like I said, was slower than the microphone. Right. Yeah. Oh, I once took apart an Apple III because I wanted to see what the what seems so unusual about it was that it had an arrangement of uh, double-decker and maybe even triple-decker interface cards for the motherboard or something. Yeah, it was. And was that unreliable? Yeah, it was very unreliable. Because, um, that was <laughs> we, the we single uh, most unreliable part of it, which is between two IC pins over a tenth inch apart, we could run two traces. Uh, and that was in those days. That was too tight of dimension. And that plus the cards kept coming unseated. During shipping. And it was supposed to have a clock part so we could date every file mm -hmm. and the company that the clock chip didn't come out with the same sort of part. So we couldn't put it in. So the Apple III had just a lot of breakdowns and really no software except for this account when it came out, I believe. Um, because we were doing a whole bunch of packages ourselves in house, but none of ours were finished. So it, it just got a bad start. When you get a bad start, it's pretty. You know, when I come those bad for me, I don't want to touch that product for a long time. And they did leverage all of the brilliance of the Apple II and all of the installed base of the Apple II. I mean, they put it into pretty much a crippled mode in the Apple III. Oh yeah, you could put it. What if we had if we had called it the high-end Apple II, put it up in Apple II, <coughs> you'd have what the business people wanted. They wanted more memory for larger spreadsheets, and they wanted 80 columns for more months on their spreadsheets. But we actually had to put chips into it. Marketing had to put chips in to disable those features in the Apple II mode. So we actually spent money to disable the good Apple II so that people would think the Apple II is only for games and the Apple III is for business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's what uh, professional management does. <laughs> <laughs> marketing marketing uh, driven. Actually, that was a whole marketing decision. Yeah. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of us had Apple II when we were in school. Is a platform for whatever technology classes were invented. Right. My kids today in high school still have a requirement for a semester of computer, whatever. What would be your thoughts on what kids in high school should be getting in school nowadays for technology education? Well, for my daughter, I insist that she learn uh, programming. She's not, you know, she wants to be an actress and a singer and a lot. Not my choice, uh, but you know, I insist that she learns how to program. And I think I think any kid who graduates from high school without a understanding of programming concepts and techniques is being done a horrible disservice. Because understanding what goes on underneath the lid, even just a little bit, gives you such an advantage um, in in a, in a world dominated by computers. Today. We come from computers, so we kind of believe in that. And I used to think that way. I decided it's better to let kids find their own path and do what they want. You're much more motivated if that's the direction you want to go. So make the computer programming available in every school. I also don't like saying every student has to learn the same thing. That's yeah, one no. problem we have today. You have a class of 30 kids. Everybody has to hear the teacher and learn the same subjects on the same pages in the book on the same day. 
you know, we haven't got the computers being teachers yet to where every student can go in different directions at their own speeds. Yeah, there's yeah. lots of ways to learn programming. Um, you know, and I didn't say she had to learn C, for example, or Fortran or anything like that. It's like, no, you have to be able to understand, you know, what these things are doing. How does a spreadsheet work? You know, how do you make a, how do you use a spreadsheet? How do you, you know, there's, um, yeah, there's a, so many different training courses out there on computers. That also, I'm sure there's one that will appeal to everyone. Don't turn them on by making something hard, a hard computer. Yeah. Right. Make it easy to see things simply quickly in front of your eye. And um, I was going to say something else. <laughs> no, but he's right. I mean, don't make it hard, right? Because if, if someone starts on something and then immediately they're shot down, um, that's an emotional wound that isn't overcome for, if ever. That's, that's really bad. But then again, I think those who don't know anything about computers, they will end up feeling left out later on in life because they won't understand what's going on. The one that learns it the best is the one that, on their own, discovers a little manual, maybe it's even basic on an Apple II, and starts trying it out and says, God, I love this stuff. How accessible is that? Well, actually, yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, looking back at the Apple II, is there anything you guys would have changed um, in it, like added to it, or, or anything you would have wanted to have done to it? I would have spent more time in Vegas. And I know that my head was in a good place for all these decisions I made. Weird addressing of the screen, I still to this day you know why it was right. Um, but I do think about the, the basic. I wrote my, my, I want to get my basic done so quick in the homework club for the Apple One. And I thought I'll save a month if I just strip out my, I'd written a syntax table. I strip out the floating point, I'll save a month. I'll be that much soon. I'll, I'll be able to have a better chance of being the first to have one for the 6502. So in the Apple II, although I included floating point routines in the raw, I never incorporated them into the basic, and that resulted in having to go to Microsoft. Yeah, that yeah, was unfortunate. Yeah. So uh, seeing that this two controller card condensed down to a single chip, do you find that astounding, or are you, are you kind of this is the natural order of things with the IWM chip? Uh, yeah. Natural order. I mean, it wasn't any revolutionary breakthrough. Like the original design was, I mean, just right insane. You know, he didn't, he didn't know that he couldn't do that. So you know, when I look back, I can't believe where I got my designs, where they came from. I could never do it again. But yeah, it was, it was just though. And he never dropped an acid. So. <laughs> 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 that you know of. Um, yeah. Have it in you. Um, so after you left Apple, what was the most interesting? Afterwards, the remote control was really, really great, great project. When I had kids, my teaching years, I taught fifth grade, it was a goal of my life. Eight years, no press, all secret, uh, us festivals. So, something in there, us festivals, been a great, great, great thing. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you were part of this decision or who made decisions. Was the idea that the Mac would not be back, backward compatible in the Apple II, was that an engineering decision or a marketing decision? Because I know later they developed the LC, which you could put into a 2E mode, but not a 2GS. Getting the Mac working at all was a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. To do a great project just like the Apple II, it had to be fresh design, not based on other things. So, yeah. yeah. It was, yeah, engineering. Uh, I wouldn't even call it a decision. I mean, it was like a, a given. Right? Everyone was building their own thing, so you don't think, oh my gosh, if the thought never occurred, if we, if we tried it and caught it or something. But emulators can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but I mean, there were people who thought it should be compatible with Lisa, and that was that was a big argument between Jobs and Lisa the group, because they hated each other. You know, but with Apple II, there really wasn't any, it, it would not have been possible at that time. Would have been possible to have a better transition path? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely would have been possible to have a better transition path. And then, yeah, could have produced the Mac for, sold Mac for less, and uh, helped encourage education into it, you know, which is where the Apple II shine. Looking, looking back is kind of a bad thing to do, mm -hmm. really wanted. Yeah. But I still think we should have done as much as we could to get as much out of the Apple II um, and build the Mac up in its time frame. While not expected to take over instantly day one. 
for example, there were a lot of trying to kill the Apple II, not just ignoring it in the company. Trying to kill it, putting its building way away from Cupertino. We loved working there, actually. Um, I, I, believe, I don't believe in all in the campus philosophy at all. And it was a building that was way far away, and it was stuck between uh, freeways and a road, so it was actually a triangular building. So it was called the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, yeah. Jobs, yeah. Jobs, jobs, jobs would always say they're all bozos over there. Is how we would talk about it to yeah. the higher ups in the company. But um, but you know what? The world was changing to the Sony floppy disk, the plastic cover that was so convenient to, to hold and use. So the Macintosh was going to try to save a little money and have a one-sided version. To get it a little cheaper than everyone else. One sided. And everyone else in the world would have the two-sided disk. Well, in the Apple II division, we were not allowed to buy the two-sided from Sony. Their chairman said, Steve Jobs is over here, and said we're not allowed to sell anyone in Apple a two-sided one because they didn't, the Macintosh group didn't want a better disk on another computer. That sort yeah. of thing was going on mm -hmm. all over the place. The other, the other um, decision that I disagree with Jobs to this day is that the Mac should have been extendable. They should have had uh, the ability to add on hardware. Um, in that case, we could have done like an Apple II add-on card, for yeah. example. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't have, we, it would have been impossible inside of it, but we should have made it extendable. Raging. But the most creative people in the company, in my mind, all my best friends were working on Macintosh. I was too, up to my plane crash, because I like being around those people. You know, Andy Hertz, mm -hmm. Bill Atkinson, Earl Smith, who never went to college, was, had become as good a hardware designer as I was. And they snuck in, they put it in a test board, and would tell me secretly that was just so they could sneak in an expansion ability. But Jobs caught on to it before it shipped. Yeah. What <laughs> job <laughs> 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 He understood electronics, but not engineering. He never was an engineer. He never wrote code. But that's good for Apple. That's why we have the great products we have today. Yeah. It's there for the everybody who doesn't understand engineering. You've got to work through a lot of engineering to get there and remove it and get out of presence of mind for the people who aren't engineers. And that's where Steve was driven from. That's really that was really his great benefit in his later years. Uh, back. Um, there's a lot of focus on uh, 3D printing and things like the Raspberry Pi and these little um, system on a chip kind of boards. And there's a lot of comparison between those and the Apple II as far as kickstarting personal computing. And now they're talking about kickstarting um, the 3D printing revolution or whatever. Um, what do you think about that as people are using the Apple II as the prototype for the next industrial revolution, they're calling it? Um, how do you react to people using that? As I the bought an Apple Pie, and I started reading in the book. <laughs> Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi. But as, I, as you read the first chapters in the book, you realize that the motivation to reach young people about really learning computers and technology was the same as I had with the Apple II. So I became a fan of it. You know, it's kind of like you got into the Linux, and it just wouldn't, I couldn't create my own boot up disk. It wouldn't work, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't work. And I'd start researching online, and finally, End of some Linux command, change the capital Z to a small Z for a Macintosh, and it works. And you know, and it just made me remember a lot of horrors that I've left. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as um, uh, I do want to take the Raspberry Pi sessions here, though. Um, as far as 3D printing, um, I, I used to be really negative on it. Now I'm starting to think if the price comes down to like 130 bucks, heck, everybody would have one, whether they really, um, you know, are going to learn 3D design and all that stuff. I, I think, I think huge. right now at the, at, at the price of 3D printers, they make a lot of sense in companies. But it's a personal thing to own in your home. What are you going to do? Download a few things and, and print your plastics at a very expensive cost? Maybe Kinko's. I think Kinko's is probably a better way to look through. I'm pretty sure it'll keep coming down in price, and that's the way it always works. I mean, the patent I, expires. I have a friend. A few yeah. more yeah, it's about to expire on 3D printing. Yeah, yeah, that's when the price is supposed to come down. Wow. I have yeah. a friend who just had her crown printed at the dentist. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, heart valves. Yeah. 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 Heart, heart, you know, yeah. parts of hearts have been delivered that way. Yeah. Yeah. Long yeah. extension. Yeah. yeah. Hi. This is a question for both of you. 36 years after the Apple II has come out, in your opinion, why is there still an annual convention for it? Misfits. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, perhaps the passion that we put into it uh, still echoes today, and because I mean it really was—it was a labor of love. It wasn't done for 
the IPO or anything like that. I, I think that just because it was done so thoughtfully and we were trying to make it so that other people could use it and experience the same joy that we had. That's my view. And maybe they still have festivals for things like, you know, the early Atari computers and Commodores. Yeah, as I was saying, isn't it all of it too is how about how open the system ended up being? Because I know that's what resonates with me is that you can still expand it, design new things that, that yes. never were possible back in '77. Yeah, that's just that's an amazing thing, and not many computers after it had. Much as I love the Macintosh, and I used it when I was a little kid, it it was not expandable until later, and very it took a very expensive Mac to be expandable. Yes, yeah. too. I mean, using Raspberry Pis as storage, um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> servers. <laughs> And all this stuff, yeah, it's just uh, there's no limit to the expandability. But don't forget the Apple One was designed was never owned by Apple. Right. Right. Given away at the Humber Computer Club. And I somehow think I went over to Randy's house and hand wired, soldered every wire to build you an Apple One prototype. Well, I had one, it just never worked reliably. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did a lot of wiring, it wasn't two. There's only two I ever built of those, so yeah. <laughs> it's precious. I don't know where it is. Oh, that'd be worth some money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
read that, and when, when I read it, it's really the first time I've read that story. I found it devastating. What happened with that? Was it, it wasn't as described in the book, that it was just, it's already done? Uh, I, I've heard two different sides of that story. Um, I do know that uh, Jobs basically after 1980 ignored uh, Daniel, and since he wasn't helpful to Steve to further his career, he just sort of let Daniel languish in, in the back of the company. And at the same time, we brought in a lot of professional management, um, you know, Tom Whitney's and Ken Vickers, who believes that only people with degrees uh, should be uh, promoted and allowed to work. And, you know, Daniel's degree wasn't in anything. So that was kind of what happened there. Um, yeah, but you know, the Quas, uh, Quas plan actually rescued. Uh, no, not, no, it wasn't the Quas plan. Daniel was so key. I didn't read the book. But in the Apple II days, there were five people as important as Randy, David Cogkey, Chris Espinosa, and a couple others that I gave a huge amount of support around the person's office. Yeah. Uh, besides getting checks 
from the school districts, what kind of feedback did you get from teachers and other people who are actually using the Apple II products? Well, at the beginning, the teachers were very afraid of it. Um, they were afraid that it was going to be their job. And that's why we um, started off donating a single computer to each school. Um, we didn't go to um, college because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't you know, sophisticated enough. But for high schools, we donated one to try and help eliminate the fear factor from the teachers. Because, yeah, the first thing everybody does is fear for their job. Not for no blame, you know, that establishes that. Do any of you know where the first Apple One manufactured ever got sold and went? Okay, Homebrew Computer Club. A woman just told us named Liza Loa talked about how she rolled computers into fourth, fifth, and sixth graders and taught them some computer stuff and taught them how it was instructions put in by a human if it did something wrong. You know, they taught the stuff that I had grown up in elementary school falling in love with. So I drove Steve Jobs up to Cotati, California. We were going to start with our Apple One, and she sat down and told us what she did. And all the way back, I said we should give her the first Apple One, but he wouldn't go for it, so I had to buy it. He made me buy it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, the spreadsheet—it it was squashed by the company, but does it still exist anywhere? I've uh, autographed uh, manuals of it, so I know some people have it. Uh, all Apple was allowed to sell 100 of them some limited quantity. They had to put a little note in since she provided courtesy of Steve Jobs and Mike Scott. <laughs> which were right. kind of the ones quashing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so there are there are some out there. Yeah. The TV sites didn't exist back then. No, they didn't. I keep my copy in my most precious objects category. I have a copy, but uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Was the, um, the River Falls Public Schools, because he was there, my mother got it and it was the spreadsheet program they used. They also used it as a page layout program and a database. Oh my God. Programs that did that. And I've still got the manual and I've got the disks, although I don't know if they'll work. So. All right. Cool. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's escape. Wow. I just want to ask, are there any current projects or ideas for projects that either of you have that you might be working on or are working on that you I mean, I, I, mean I, I love what I'm doing at Square, helping yeah. uh, people form their own businesses. Um, to me, that's still making a difference. It's not filling the world with more ads and you know, stuff like that. It's like empowering people to do their own thing. Same thing at eBay. You know, I felt really good about it whenever you get an email in that, you know, thank you for allowing me to start my own business or something. I mean, that's just, that feels really good. Um, there's so many startups going on that want to It's great. So I had a lot of changes in this very similar impact as well as logic design. And I wanted for 35 years to find a way to make monolithic chips high density that use optics instead of electronics. Photons are lighter than electrons, so they use less power, is the theory. Getting close to where some research projects have shown things like a diode. A photon can go through one way, not the other. Two diodes can make a logic game. But we've gotten down to the density of chips now that's so important that it's less than the wavelength of light. So it's a real problem that that would ever come about. However, if you could make a chip with one core instead of ten cores, but they ran ten times as fast and used no power, they could still have a way. And also in the software area, I'm with the company Fusion IO leader in turning all the servers and all the data centers from hard disks to NAND flash memory chips. Most of you probably um, half of the data that you have, the stuff you do in your computer life is coming off of our boards and not hard disks. If you use things like Facebook or any of the other big social networks, any music networks, and or whatever, if you use Apple, iTunes, or anything, it's all coming off our boards. Um, it's been a big change. Well, I sit there and think, they still use them as solid state disk drives. The board plugs into the computer like my floppy disk. The software in the computer has been able to take our first board of our company, increase its performance and density four times in four years just by software. It's the way we did things with the disk too. But um, I'm thinking that, my gosh, you plug these boards in with terabytes. You could, and the, then you act as though they're a, a disk that can be used as a disk drive. Get rid of that whole disk thing. We now have APIs that let you use it like RAM. Write a program for your whole database 
maybe you're, you're selling wines and you have four servers or something, cutting down to one with one of our boards, um, but keep it all in the program and don't have one single storage command. Programming language not using a single storage command or operating system with no storage to disk type media. And once somebody does that, it's going to work because it works just as fast. Mm -hmm. It works just as fast, even though they're a thousand times slower than RAM. But, um, but the caching techniques, we've got the APIs that handle all that. So somebody could write their entire database and not ever have a disk in their life anywhere. You know, you have a backup method. And I want to see, so when the first one of those happens, it might very much change a lot of people with small businesses. Say, why am I using a language that has variables instead of trees and all? And why am I then saving it off in storage that's in its file system? Just keep the one tree in memory. Yeah. Are you aware that there are people who are significant people in KFest who wrote in, uh, instant messaging systems for the Apple II GS and who wrote a data communication system such that they could log on to a slip or PPP account from a 2GS? I've heard of that before, even 10 years ago at KFest. Something like this, so here we are. Very precious. 